well, this is how it must look because we've always done it this way. So I'm sure there were some experts back here at some point, right, that developed like this is what human development needs. There were experts, but they were experts on how to break a human system. This was this Prussian system designed for mass obedience in the times of the Industrial Revolution. The most damaging part of a conveyor belt school system is that we are teaching the young people they are not to be trusted. You are only allowed to really speak to, for the majority of the day, people of your own data manufacturer. If I'm six, I'm only around other six-year-olds. I'm gonna stand in my straight line. I'm gonna raise my hand and ask permission for anything and everything for years on end, including I'm gonna ask another human being, even though I'm 18, if I can go to the bathroom. I'm learning to be blindly obedient to anybody who claims to be an authority. This is your assignment. This is what you're gonna do. If you obey well, I'll give you an A. If you go outside the box on this, you're not gonna get the arbitrary letter grade that I'm gonna give you. Okay, sounds good, I'm working on it. Ding, bell rings, move on to the next part of the conveyor belt. Whether you're enjoying what you're doing or not, it doesn't matter, right? It's this industrial revolution model based on authoritarianism that builds that mindset into the young heroes. You leave there going, I don't know anything about me, but I know how to obey. I know how to follow directions. Tell me what to, somebody tell me what to do next. And there's this old saying, it's like a bird's born in a cage, think flying is an illness. The last 150 years or so has been this social experiment of schooling. And so what happens for a lot of parents too, is they, even if they see this from an intellectual standpoint and they try to leave, they, they fly out of the cage, there's still this emotional tie to what everybody else is doing and what they've already known. That was Matt Boudreau, a provocative thought leader in educational and personal development practices. He's a two-time featured TEDx speaker and was named Corporate Trainer of the Year at Stanford University. With an extensive qualification list, he not only has been both a public and private school teacher and administrator, he's also a keynote speaker, consultant, and coach to organizations around the world with clients who have ranged from Wells Fargo and Honeywell to American Eagle and the United States Air Force. In 2017, Matt Boudreau founded Acton Academy Play schools that emphasized on self-direction and cultivating confident, independent young people with a strong sense of character and personal responsibility. He is changing the game in education today and has since helped to open multiple campuses around the world. As a husband and father, his life and family drives him to be the best example he can be for his children who are watching him. I cannot wait for you to hear our conversation. I could have gone on for hours with this guy and I'm so glad I was able to get him on the podcast. Welcome to the Ellen Fisher Podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Matt. I am so excited for this conversation and thank you for being here. I am honored. It's been a uh, been a long time coming, so it's going to be fun. Yeah, there's so much I want to talk about and I just want to jump right in and ask you, what do you believe is the purpose of education? Isn't that a great question? Yeah. What should education be for? You know, and I talk about that a lot because people don't ask that question. You're not asked that question when you go to become a teacher. You're not asked that question as a parent. You're not asked that question as a student. That's it. So my personal question and or my personal answer to that, and I believe it is a very personal question. Right? When you ask somebody, what should education be for? What you're asking is what should education be for, for you, for your goals, for who you are designed to be and what you want to accomplish. Right. So education for me is really comes down to sovereignty. If you're taking a look at the roots of of the words education and, you know, educare means to to draw out. You want to draw out the unique uh, abilities of of that specific individual. But there's also, you know, you want to scaffold uh, the the awareness, the self-confidence, the, um, you know, the understanding how to build the life that person wants to. So ultimately, it comes back to sovereignty and freedom to be who you want to be, to do the things you want to do. And how do you think that differs from our modern education system today? No, oh, goodness gracious, it's the antithesis. You know, and it, I, always, I, I always like to preface these kind of conversations with the understanding that uh, I, I am on the side of good human beings who are teachers and administrators in our modern system. And when I say modern system, I don't just mean public schools. I also mean private schools because private schools are modeled very much after the, the, the public school system. If you're a good human in those systems, I am on your side. I love you. I thank you. I appreciate you. I want nothing but the best for you. I think you need to be there 
because those systems aren't going away. And there are some young people, the reality is you're going to be the best human beings they're going to meet because they go home and the humans that are raising them are, are not quite as, as uh, intentional, not quite as loving, right? So I want those people there. My beef is always with the system itself. So you asked, how is that different? Well, the difference is the system that we utilize is a system of schooling. Schooling and education aren't the same. If education is for sovereignty and drawing out that unique ability and being able to scaffold a life that you want to live, well, it's the antithesis because schooling says everybody do the same thing at the same time in this very narrow uh, scheme of academia that doesn't really necessarily transfer over to anything else in life. It's not a system that is easily transferable. And I always tell people, it's like, you know, you go for 12 years every day to learn how to play checkers. And then all of a sudden you graduate and everybody's like, okay, cool. Here's your basketball, go shoot a three pointer. And you're like, wait, I've been playing checkers for 12 years, right? It's well, it's like, yeah, but they're both games. Okay. But they're very different games that require very different skill sets and they have very different rules. So being good at school and, and we know this. Being good at school does not necessarily mean you're good at life. Some people are good at school and then they go out and they crush it. But I would say it's in spite of, not because of, because you and I both know people that didn't do well in school, but they're phenomenally successful. They're wildly happy. They're very intentional about their life. We also know people who got the straight A's and are miserable and have, you know, the success hasn't transferred over, right? So. That's my problem with this. It's actually the antithesis of what education should be. First of all, I'm so glad that you brought up teachers and affirming the good teachers, the good people that are yes, in our education system, because I think a lot of times people hear criticism of the education system and assume it that means that there's criticism of just all the teachers lumping everyone right. together when really that's not what you're talking about. So, uh, yeah, so I'm so glad you brought that up at the beginning of this conversation. And then secondly, when you're talking about our education system and the difference between what you think our education should be versus what our modern system is, um, a lot of times it feels like education is meant to be for how to get a job, not how mm. to be successful in life. And when you say success in life, some people think, well, that means when you get a good job, that's success mm. in life. But success in life is um, could mean a lot of different things. And it's right. not just to that. So it's a personal question, right? Success for me looks very different than success for you because we're different people. There's some things that cross over for sure. And if you ask parents and I've had the opportunity and again, I've been a public school teacher. I've been a public school administrator. I've been a private school teacher, a private school administrator. I worked at Stanford. I've worked with universities all over the world. I know the game inside now. And if you talk to parents and you say, Hey, what do you want for your young heroes when they get older? There's a, a somewhat of a baseline answer, right? But the baseline answer is I want them to be happy. I want them to be healthy. I want them to be productive. I want them to have good relationships. You know, I want them to be somewhat sovereign. I want them to spend every day excited. I want those are the baseline answers. Nobody says I want them to be wildly proficient at algebra two when they're, you know, that's never the answer, right? So those are the baselines. So when you understand that that's the baseline, you go, crap, well, how do you make sure that you have that for every person? It's a really tough thing to say, well, there's a standardized process when life is anything but standard, your, you know, our backgrounds are anything but standard, right? It's almost impossible to really make that, to make that happen. Yeah, because school is kind of set up, like our modern system is set up to kind of for one type of learner as well. And I look at that the way my sister, my sister and I grew up because, like you said, some people didn't do well in school but are successful in life. I would consider myself one of those people. I wasn't horrible at school, but I wasn't great at it. I hated test taking. I had to study so hard for it. And then it would just, as soon as I finished the test, it was in one ear, out the other. Didn't absorb any of it. Yeah. Right. Well, and you're talking about earlier getting a job, right? And like that's the ultimate, like that's the end all be all. That's the goal. So – my career in public speaking, and when I say career in public speaking, there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, they say speaker uh, or, because they've done some keynotes, and that's fantastic. I actually, for many, many years, was doing 60 to 70 keynotes a year for the largest corporations in the country. So I actually had a career, and this was while I was building these schools. 
So the reason I was working with these organizations, so they were asking me to come in because they were saying they were hiring all of these Harvard and Stanford and MIT and these graduates. They're really, 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 really smart, really smart. They're really good at school. And they're going, oh, but we kind of want to fire all of them because they're not really good at work. They're not really good at resilience. They're not really good at, right? So even the grades to job, the employers are going, okay, this isn't working either. So they're getting the job, but again, it's not transferring over. And so you've got that experience. It's the same thing. Some people did really, really well at school. I, I did really well at school. I'm not that smart. I got the game. I understood the game. I understood the pattern very early. So I got my straight A's and then I got done at school and went, crap, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm good at, actually. I, I, I really don't know. Somebody please give me a job, right? And it, there's so many people that fall in, in that spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, and, and none of that is what you would call efficient or effective by any stretch. Yeah, and growing up, my like I was saying, my sister is actually was actually really good at school, and okay, yeah. and seeing us comparing, it was like, why is it such a struggle for me? I mean, yeah. I'm I'm saying it a little bit bigger than it was. I was not a like a really bad student. It was just that I had to work a lot harder for it. I was like a B sure. and sometimes A student, and my sister could just get A's without even studying. It was just came really naturally to her. And so growing up, there's also that comparison factor with kids. Like, why is it that? you know, my sister's having an easier time and I'm not. So I think all of that comes into play and is really relevant discussion that so many people are forgetting to discuss when it comes to our education. So true. And, and again, there's the natural component, right? Because you're a wildly intelligent human being. Oh, like, I, don't know, I don't know about that, but thank you. <laughs> I do know. But that's the thing is I do know about that because and I agree with, you know, we talked offline before we started, we were talking about John Taylor Gatto and one of the things that John said was that he had come to realize that that genius was as common as dirt. Hmm. And I believe that hmm. wholeheartedly. I believe that. And genius has a weird, we have this weird connotation in society where we think that this is, okay, if you could label somebody a genius, well, that means they're ultra academic and they know everything all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody knows everything all the time. Nobody knows 1% of 1% of 1% of all the things there are to know in the world, right? But that's a capability that is there. There is a potential that is there and it's a unique capability and potential that can really go forward and make big waves, can really go forward and change the world. You just have to find out what that unique genius is for each person. And so again, we're talking about this very, very, very narrow game of school that some people are inherently going to be good at, just like some people are going to naturally be better football players than others. Mm -hmm. But just because, you know, um, I'm here and my brother's here, we're same household, he's really good at football, I'm not. And then we go, Ugh, I guess that means he's going to be successful at life. What? It's not the same game. Yeah. It's not the same. Quick little break for our sponsor, Bite. The best toothpaste on the market that once you try it, you'll never want to go back to regular tube toothpaste. While most commercial toothpastes are filled with harsh chemicals and artificial preservatives and flavors, stuff you don't want to be putting in your mouth, let alone eating, Bite makes dry toothpaste tablets made with clean ingredients that are sulfate, palm oil, and glycerin free. And on top of that, the jars are so pretty. It comes in these beautiful refillable glass jars and they send refills in compostable pouches. So they're better for our bodies and our earth. No more plastic toothpaste tubes. Bite toothpaste bits are so convenient. You just pop a bit in your mouth, chew it up and start brushing. It will turn into paste just like you're used to, but with no plastic tube or messy paste, which makes it extra convenient for kids who think popping a bite in their mouth is so fun and makes toothbrushing a pleasant experience. It honestly felt a little weird at first, but my whole family is now obsessed. It's so effective and makes my teeth feel extremely clean. It's literally the best toothpaste I've ever used. Bite makes plastic-free alternatives for everything on your bathroom sink, from toothpaste, mouthwash, toothbrushes, and deodorant, so you can cut out the harsh chemicals and plastic waste without compromise. And Bite is offering our listeners 20% off your first order. Go to trybite.com slash Ellen or use the code Ellen at checkout to claim this deal. That's T-R-Y-B-I-T-E dot com slash Ellen. So what would be in your mind how you would change our modern education system? Let's say you had that ability to do that. What would you make it? What would you do to make it different? 
Well, I, and I love that question. And, and some people will agree with a lot of what I say. And there's people obviously that will probably disagree with certain components. And I, and I think that's great. I think these are the kind of conversations you need to have. And we need to understand that civil discourse is uh, wildly valuable if we're ever going to actually make progress. Now, uh, the one caveat before I answer this too is understanding that uh, government school government schooling is not going to go anywhere. It's not going to change. Um, you know, I, I've had so many people say, okay, well, how do we change this? We, we won't. Uh, there's too much money power politics to keep things the way that it is. It's too big of a clunky machine. There's not going to be any real change there. But what there is a, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, mompreneurs, dadpreneurs who are stepping outside and going, okay, then let's build something different. So my answer to how is really around the how it's actually being done right now, building something different, including the schools that I built. You know, I had all that experience in the public and private sector, but I had my own young heroes who were growing up and my oldest, I'm looking at her going, I can't send you to these places. I just can't. And it's not a sheltering thing. It's a, I know this isn't real education thing. So I had to build something different. And I've now partnered with entrepreneurs around the world to do this very thing. So um, it's a multifaceted approach. One uh, thing that we've done that's been wildly successful is I mentioned civil discourse. We utilize the Socratic method. Uh, and the reason we do so is because we want to stoke the flames of curiosity. We want to make sure that curiosity does not die. In a traditional school system, curiosity is snuffed out on average by about the age of eight. Kids come in super fired up, they're ready to go, they're super creative, and that just gets crushed out of the habit of schooling. By the time they're eight, they're like, all right, well, I'm just playing this game and, and I'm either going to play it well or I'm not or you know whatever that looks like, right? So the Socratic method, we want people to understand, we want young heroes to understand how to think, not what to think, how to think how to articulate what it is they believe and why they believe it, to provide evidence, like what does a good conversation look like? What are the rules of engagement on a good conversation? How do I listen to somebody else's point of view and go, okay, I'd love to hear your evidence and why you think that. And then they can have that, that you know, they can share that back and forth and at the end of it, they can go, oh, okay, we agree on this, we disagree on this, and hey, by the way, we can still be friends, right? Like that's such an important component of success no matter what, because at the end of the day, Ellen, you and your husband don't agree on 100% of the things 100% of the time. And totally. he's the closest person to you, mm -hmm. right? So what, you just pack it up and, and call, like, that's ridiculous. You know, you come together on the things and you and I would be the same way. We could find a lot we agree on. We'll find a lot we disagree on. That doesn't take away from the fact that I think you're a really cool person and I like to be your friend. Like that, totally. you know? So, so that civil discourse and the Socratic method uh, is wildly important uh, as a foundational pillar. Another foundational pillar is uh, learning to set one's own goals. So we don't, you know, on our campuses, we don't issue academia altogether. We just go, okay, we don't put it on a pedestal. We want you to have different ways to tackle certain concepts, not just the rote memorization and regurgitation. How does this apply to the real world? Can we give you like a little mini project that exemplifies this more than just, I'm gonna, you know, uh, repeat, repeat after you kind of thing. But I learned to set my own goals around that. I learned to go, okay, by the end of the week, I want to accomplish this. So I become more purpose-driven because I'm starting to, and I get some awareness too of what I'm actually capable of accomplishing in a short amount of time. So individualized goals matter. Collaborative goals matter around experiences. So we put together big experiences, big exposure experiences, and let people collaborate to try to figure out how to solve real problems together. And the exposure piece is again, to let people have a true sense of self-awareness because they've actually tried a number of different things. You know, and the analogy that I use for this is if you've only ever grown up eating five different foods, Right? And we have like five different subjects in school, as if life works in subjects, which it doesn't. But we have these five different subjects, right? So if you only had five different foods, and I said to you, Ellen, what's your favorite food? You're like, um, it's this one, right? Or, or maybe if you're crazy, you're like, ooh, I like to combine these two, okay? But if you've grown up eating a buffet and you've been exposed to all different foods from all different, 
then you are actually making a choice. It's an mm. informed choice. And then you can start to really get creative because you're like, ooh, well, if I take a little of this and a little of this, right? And so it's the same thing. We want to expose them to all kinds of different um, concepts. We want to expose them to all kinds of different problems, all kinds of different theories, all kinds. And we do that in a collaborative nature. Uh, then we give them massive amounts of responsibility. That's another thing. And it's, to me, the most damaging part of a conveyor belt school system is that we are teaching the young people they are not to be trusted. Mm. Can you elaborate on that? Like explain it a little bit more. You bet. You are only allowed to uh, really speak to, for the majority of the day, people of your own data manufacturer, right? Like if I'm six, I'm only around other six-year-olds. So I, true. I can, right? If I'm 12, I, I hang out with 12-year-olds, I automatically get to look down on the youngers. I automatically have to revere the olders. But then I'm going to stand in my straight line. I'm going to raise my hand and ask permission for anything and everything for years on end, including I'm going to ask another human being, even though I'm 18, if I can go to the bathroom, that human being might go, no. And I go, okay. Right? I'm learning to be blindly obedient to anybody who claims to be an authority. I am, this is your assignment. This is what you're going to do. You're, if you obey well, I'll give you an A. If you go outside the box on this, you're not going to get the, the arbitrary letter grade that I'm going to give you. Okay, sounds good. I'm working on it. Ding, bell rings. Move on to the next part of the conveyor belt. Whether you're enjoying what you're doing or not, it doesn't matter. Right? It's this industrial revolution model based on authoritarianism that builds that mindset into the young heroes. You leave there going, I don't know anything about me, but I know how to obey. Mm -hmm. I know how to follow directions. Tell me what to, somebody tell me what to do next. And we wonder why when the government or whoever claims to be authority goes, look, this is what you're going to do and this is when you're going to do it. People go, yep, you got it. Sure, yeah. whatever you say, right? That's a big problem. So we want young heroes to have massive amounts of personal responsibility. And that comes on our campuses in many forms, whether it's, uh, teaching other uh, young heroes that you're working with, whether it is taking on a job on campus, it's cleaning up you know, the bathrooms at the end of the day, it's becoming the chef at school and you're cooking the food for everybody. Whatever that looks like, you're taking on massive responsibility and you're also starting businesses, you're taking on internships, you're taking on apprenticeships, you're doing hard things early so that you see you're not fragile. And so you're building self-confidence in that way too because self-confidence doesn't come through affirmations you know those right. affirmations have to be tied to something otherwise you don't actually even believe it so you've got to actually do some hard things and stack some victories there so that you can go back on that so it's yeah it's a multifaceted approach to how you scaffold that but we think all of those things are, are valuable pillars and we've had a lot of really good success with that that's amazing and i think it's very important like you brought up about just thinking we have to do whatever we're told and losing our power basically because you've said something before about how this this statement that we like to say that we want to raise critical thinkers and we want to help people our children to grow up independent yet the actions that we're we're doing to help them is actually the opposite of that can you elaborate exactly on that a little right. more yeah that's exactly right so it's the it's that walking contradiction and it's the lack of transferability Right? So I think anything you're doing, I think there's a lot of power when things are uh, transferable. There's a lot of power. Then what I mean by transferable is, and I use sports analogies, um, I use sports analogies a, a lot, but uh, there's a concept in sports of, of like squaring up your hips and, and um, having a little bit of flexion in your knees and kind of this ready position, right? In that ready position, you're ready to go tackle the guy in football. You're ready to field the ground ball in baseball. You're ready to play defense in basketball. You're right, it's a transferable thing, right? There's a lot of skills that should be transfer, barely any of the schools are, uh, school skills are transferable to, to anything else. Because what you're doing is you're building these habits and you, theoretically these habits are supposed to transfer into, okay, now I know how to be a self-sufficient human being. Well, when your habits are thinking, no, 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 you're telling me what to do. You're telling me to regurgitate the information. 
There's a very specific thing I'm supposed to regurgitate back. There's a very specific time I'm supposed to do this. Everybody does this specific thing at this specific time. You are stripping the individuality away from that person for 12 years straight and then releasing him or her into the world and saying, now go be an individual. Yeah, it is it nothing like sense. what There's it's actually no nothing. Logic. Yeah, <laughs> so no true. Logic there. And I think a lot of people have never even asked the question, what is the purpose of education? Because we're just told right. this is what education is. It's these five subjects. And no yes. one has really thought, well, what about all these other things that are just as important, if not more important to have? A happy life, a, a fulfilled life, a life where you can communicate well with other people. Right. Like you said, going back to that civil discourse thing, that yeah. should be a core important aspect of everyone's lives growing up because so many people grow up yes. not knowing how to have conversations with people that they disagree with and getting yeah. tense about it, feeling like Very I can't emotional. speak to you. Yeah, so much about that. And I think a lot of times people might think, well, all those other things about how to be a good human or a self-reliant human, that's what what your parents are supposed to do. And then education okay. is just specific subjects. What would you have to say to that? Yeah, that's and that's great. Parents should be leading by example. 100% they should. But if you have to go somewhere else to learn quote unquote subjects, when we already know life doesn't work in subjects, what about statistics that show, uh, you know, maybe a home educated young person who can go from when they're ready, developmentally speaking, when they go from I'm just really starting to mess with numbers until um, wildly proficient in algebra, and that takes about a hundred total hours. Total. Wow. It doesn't take eight years. It doesn't yeah. take nine years. So what are we actually doing for that long? Yeah. And and again, school was not designed by if this was the 12 year plan and all this kind of stuff was what was going to make and the academia focus, if that was what was going to make strong citizens, well, we've got like 92% of our population has gone through this system. Do we have a whole bunch of educated, happy, well rounded, productive human? But we don't. Now, I'm not saying it's just school's fault, but I'm, I'm, you know, it's a multifaceted thing. But man, you would think we'd have so much more success. So, um, you know, especially you with how to, much time that we spend in school. Like you're so saying. much time because at home, if you're homeschooling, you can get that amount of work done in such a shorter period of time. And then you have the rest of the day to fulfill all these other important aspects of raising healthy, happy humans. For sure. And again, the academic focus of it is like, yeah, does some academia matter? Yeah, a little bit, but it's very, very little. And to think that it needs direct instruction at a very specific time, it's a cult mentality we've been raised into. And I, you know, I asked people, we did this kind of like a little interview on the street for this TV series that I shot that's going to come out relatively soon. And, and um, people are like, okay, yeah, but I have to, I'm not a teacher, so I have to send them somewhere so they learn this. I'm like, oh, that's great. Where did you send them to learn how to walk? <laughs> and they're like, well, I didn't send them anywhere. Right. Oh, so they were just at home with you. How did you teach? Well, I didn't teach them. So they just naturally, what you did was you encouraged the natural trajectory that included failure. You encouraged them to try something, to fail at it, and to keep going. They fell when they tried to walk. You went, yay, and they went, oh, okay, cool. Well, guess what? Learning how to read, learning how to do any kind of math that actually matters and shows up in day-to-day -day life, including things like budgeting and you know, spending and, and all those kind. It's the same thing. It's the same process. So if that's the case, what are we doing for so long? So again, it goes back to what should education be for and why does school look the way it did? And I love that we've been talking about John Taylor Gatto mm -hmm. because teachers are not given his materials when you go to get your teaching credential. And it's because if you were given his materials, a lot of the teachers would leave. Can they you explain for the people listening who don't know who John Taylor Gatto is, who he is and what you like about him? Yeah, the man was a legend. So he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, he is a an absolute national treasure that almost nobody has ever heard of. Um, so John was a phenomenal teacher in the public school system. In fact, he was uh, New York State Teacher of the Year uh, multiple times. So this man was in the, the game for over 30 years. 
uh, his resignation letter went viral uh, because he started talking about how he could no longer hurt children. And not in a physical sense, he was talking about the system of schooling. So John is, for my money, the foremost historian for why school looks the way it does in terms of the system. Why do we start at a very early age? Why do we segregate based on on age? Why do we segregate uh, schools based on class? Why do we have subjects? Why do we have the processes? And he brings it back to this historical narrative around this being a Prussian military. So a lot of people think like, oh, well, this is how it must look because we've always done it this way. So I'm sure there were some experts back here at some point, right, that developed like this is what human development needs. There were experts, but they were experts on how to break a human system. They were experts on how to break a mentality. So it was this Prussian system designed for mass obedience in the, in the times of the Industrial Revolution. And if you go read John's work, he is far more articulate than I am as far as that goes, and he breaks it down better than anybody. It was meant to make you a slave. Period. Mm. That's the problem. It is meant to make you a slave. And there's this old saying, it's, uh, and I think I even sent you this in the voice message last night, but it's like uh, birds born in a cage think flying is an illness. Mm. We're born at this point into the cult mentality of schooling. We forget that for all of humanity, we learned by being at home together, pursuing the purpose of whatever the purpose was for our family, and we just learned by doing. That's mm -hmm. how we've always learned throughout humanity. The last 150 years or so has been this social experiment of schooling. And the problem is, well, there's nobody older than 150 right now that can tell us like, no, nah, man, this is the way it used to be, right? So you're yeah. born into this cage. Mm -hmm. And so what happens for a lot of parents too is they, even if they see this from an intellectual standpoint and they try to leave, they, they fly out of the cage, there's still this emotional tie to what everybody else is doing and what they've already known. And they're like, oh, oh. it is just like if somebody was to leave a cult and they're like, oh, but I think I'm still, still supposed to do the sacrifice over here. Yeah. Right? I still think mm -hmm. I was, right? They try to bring the cult back because they can't quite emotionally let go of it. Yeah. That's where we are with school in this country. It's the biggest cult we have. Well, it's something that like humans tend to do in a lot of different ways that if of a majority course. of people are doing something, they yes, like, well, I guess I got to do it. There's so many um, visual experiments that they've done where you're sitting in an office and everyone else is doing this very bizarre thing, like standing up every time they hear a bell and then they sit down, but they have no idea why everyone's doing it. And then they just, just start doing it. doing it. Yeah. That's right. So that's, that's, right. that's like the, the important factor is critical thinking. <laughs> That's right. It's like the, and it's, and it, yeah, the, I mean, critical thinking enough to actually make, you know, critical thinking is one part of that, but then there's also the self-confidence and self-awareness to avoid social conformity when it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Right. And that's a whole extra level of courage that you also have to develop and scaffold in. Right. So yeah, I've seen those kind of experiments. The, um, you know, you've got the, the whole, and it's not even just humans. You got the whole like crabs in a bucket, you know, they're in there and they won't let the other crab get out. They'll pull the crab back in. Cause it's like, you're going to escape. Nope, not you. We're going to pull you back in. Right. Um, you know, monkeys doing the same thing when they're getting sprayed, going to get bananas and they're, they're not like, it's a, it's a weird thing that's baked into us that we have to really think our way out of. Totally. And can you expand a little bit more about why our modern education system became what it is today. Like the history of why did it, why was it created this way, this model? Yeah. So I, you know, I always defer to John's work on this because he will explain it better. So I'm going to give you kind of the rudimentary, you know, uh, sort of explanation, the real 30,000 foot nuts and bolts, but go, go read what he has to say about it. But um, the reality was we we're on the precipice of the industrial revolution and there was a lot of, uh, there was a, there's a multifaceted thing, but there was a lot of money to be made in the industrial revolution. If we could get a lot of people to automate the system through, you know, getting all these factory workers, they needed to be smart enough to obey and follow instructions, but not necessarily, uh, think for themselves. They needed to be made, uh, comfortable and shown that, Hey, if you just come conform, life is going to be okay. And we are going to take care of you. And so there were a lot of people that stood to make a lot of money around that the Rockefellers being one John Rockefeller put in what 
nowadays would be the equivalent of about one and a half billion dollars into the system. And he said his words, not mine. People get mad at me when I say these things, his words. <laughs> we want a nation of workers, not thinkers. Mm. They just wanted obedience. And so there was a giant push to make it so that the, you know, there was uh, just mass obedience, but it also started this whole chain, uh, this whole chain of, of issues where we wanted more, more and more obedient people. Let's start splitting up the, the, the natural family. Um, there was this entire element of how do we control a population? Well, if you make it mandatory, you require the young people of the nation to go into your religion, your training system for multiple hours a day for years on end not only will they not break out of that religion when they get older, they will turn around, have kids of their own, and feel compelled to put them right back into that religion. And that's why, no matter what I said at the beginning, Alan, about the true my true heart of I care about good teachers and administrators, some of them will still listen to this, and they'll still be mad at me. They won't go research the. They won't go research anything. They'll say, oh, Matt's against us. They won't actually hear what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But there are still so also, strong. yes, that's true. And then there are also some teachers who really feel you and are like, I totally agree with you. I feel like there's so many issues and I'm just doing my yeah. best to hold it together and help the kids. Oh, yes. Yes. I talk to them all day, every day, <laughs> all day. I talk mm -hmm. to teachers and administrators from all over every single day who are saying exactly that. And some of them are going... Some of them are going, I'm out. I can't do it anymore. Some of them are going, oh my gosh, I still, I just have to hold on because, you know, retirement is eight years away. Um, I talked to an administrator from Pennsylvania this morning who's like, dude, I'm nine years away from retirement. I just have to hold on. All of this is spot on, you know? I mean, yes. that's, it, that's real. And a lot of people, a lot of teachers have these amazing um, ideas on how to help kids grow, For but sure. they feel tied down to the system. So they're just doing they the are. best that they can. So Correct. what, yeah. So what are some things that you think our current modern system is doing right? Is there anything that, that they're doing well? You know, the, the best things aren't even the things it's the people, you know, we get a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, focus and understandably and rightfully so on some of the woke agenda kind of nonsense that gets thrown in schools. And I, I agree, like that's not okay. And there are some people that have, you know, less than uh, honorable intentions for, for being where they are doing what they do. Yes, those people exist. The majority, and again, I was in that system. I have a lot of friends still in that system. There are a lot of really good humans who are leading by example, nothing to do with the subjects they're teaching, they care and they show love and they lead by example because they're having civil discourse, because they're excited, because they're coming with a smile. They're coming, right? That's the biggest and best thing uh, that, that we do. Um, you know, and then some schools, depending on where you are, you know, I mean, they do provide, uh, they do provide various outlets. The sports programs are, are great and sports are something that I think is actually wildly underrated um, in terms of things that are helping our young heroes. So you've got, you know, programs, bits and pieces here and there. But to me, it's like, you know, it's almost like, okay, yeah, I'm going to eat my broccoli, but I'm also going to, you know, drink this poison. It doesn't cancel it out. So you still have the bad habits that are being created there, but you do have some of those shining lights. But the majority of it is the people, man. Totally. So why do you think people are so afraid of customizing their own education? Like, why do people believe we should put that in the hands of our government? Is it just because of like the conformity factor or is there anything else? Oh, it's, it's a conditioning thing, but it's a, the human nature is such that freedom scares people because freedom and responsibility are two sides of the same coin. So if you really want to be free, you really want to be sovereign, there's a massive level up in the amount of responsibility that you have to take on. So that level of responsibility is scary to, to humans in general. Um, that's the reality. It's easier. It's why um, so many people are like, ah, be healthy. That's easier. If, if you say there's a pill I can take, I'd rather take the pill. Right? It's not think about exercise. I love what Gary Vaynerchuk 
uh, says, and we had him on the podcast a while back and we were talking to him about it. He says, look, everybody knows how to work. Everybody knows how to be in shape. Everybody knows how to be healthy. Eat, eat good food and you work out. Like everybody knows that. But it's the responsibility of actually doing that day in and day out where people balk, right? So education, all education is self-education. I actually can't teach anybody anything. They have to grasp it. They have to own it. They have to decide to incorporate that into their into their life. I can point to the horizon. I can try to inspire. Uh, you know, I can try to give you some information. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Ellen's got to receive it, take it, implement it, act upon it to make it a reality. So freedom is the same way. You've got to grasp that and all of the responsibility that comes along with that. That scares the hell out of people. Yeah. And the leading by example thing is so under, like underappreciated. People aren't thinking about that near as much as it should be because that's related to even parenting. Um, the oh, way yeah. that we raise our kids, we can teach our kids, try to tell them what to do, but it's really what we're doing that's going to affect them the most. Bingo. Yeah. I always say like your kids will do what you do before they do what you say. Mm hmm. And they, there's a massive, if they see a massive disconnect between you, say, if you're like, Hey honey, you can be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do, chase your dreams. And then simultaneously they're hearing you say like, Oh, woe is me. Money doesn't grow on trees. I'm so upset. Oh, your father drives me nuts. Oh, I hate my job. God, it's Monday. Oh, thank God it's Friday. Can't wait for the week. There's a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. And even if they don't consciously get it, subconsciously they see it and it erodes trust for between you and, and your child. Um, but it also just makes them not necessarily believe that what you're saying is true. So they start to embrace that and like, ah, well, life's going to kind of suck a little bit. Totally. You know? And that's the bigger picture things you're talking about. And then it also yes, comes down to the individual things we're telling them like, don't yell when your brother does this. Don't yell at them, but then you're yelling at them for yelling. <laughs> we don't hit. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yes. It's that. Yeah, it's that. Oh. It's called it's called contradiction, all right? It's yeah. called it's called being a hypocrite. Yeah. Uh we can't we can't do it. But it's really hard for parents to like see even what they're doing sometimes because you think it's sure. different. I'm I'm parenting my kids. I, I have to do this to teach them. But then your children start acting in the same way that you're acting and you see your father or your husband in them and you see you in them and you start – it's like yes. a huge mirror reflecting onto you. That's exactly what it is. I love the way you said that. It's, it is a huge mirror. That's exactly what it is. And people um, – you know. I, I'm always quick to, to make sure I say this too, because there's no such thing as a perfect parent. There is mm -hmm. not. No. Uh, I, and I have made, you know, just as many mistakes as anybody else has on this, right? There's no such thing as a perfect parent. But I do believe we should always strive to be the perfect parent. And I think mm -hmm. that's okay to strive to really get it right and to knock it out of the park because you only have them for a short amount of time. And the way you parent them is a gift that keeps on giving for the rest of their life. Yeah. Right. So you want to try to do it as well as you possibly can. Are you going to screw some stuff up? Of course you are. But let's do it the best, you know, to the best of our ability. But I'm very, very thankful because I always, I get, uh, the question very often, how do you discipline your kids when people meet my kids? Because they meet them and they go, okay, there's something different. They're very self-confident. They're very self-assured. They're very at peace. Uh, they're very articulate. They're very friendly. There's a joy that comes off of them that is not what you normally see for an 11, a nine and a six year old. There's a confidence that comes off of them that you don't normally see. So they go, well, how do you discipline your kids? And I love it when I get that question because I always tell them, I don't discipline my kids. I have taught them how to be a disciplined human being. And that's a very different thing. And it starts with me being a disciplined human being. It starts with my wife being a disciplined human being. It starts with us being very, very intentional about who we are, how we're going to pursue our purpose, how we're going to lead this family and bringing our young heroes along with us. Totally. I love that. And I want to read something that you've said online before, which I think is just incredible. Sure. And I want people to hear it. You said, at the end of the day, your kids will have watched you live or they will have watched you exist. Your intentionality around remaining inspired, tackling challenges with grace, remaining calm in chaos and spreading positivity will be noticed or it will be missed. Be noticed. I thought yes, that was so good. Such a good reminder for people. Um, 
in just in regards to the, the, the whole parenting education thing, it's all tied in together. And I love that you yes, talk ma'am. about both. Yes, yeah. ma'am. It is the same thing. It's one and the same. They're not separate, you know, and thank you for that. And even with that, you know, when I'm, you know, I say something like that and, and I don't always dive into the comments because you never know what was going on over there. I try to answer as much as I can and help um, as much as I can. But even with that, you know, somebody, okay, yeah, easy for you to say, but. I yeah. get that a lot. A I lot. Know. I actually get that a lot too. I think I any, know you do. <laughs> yeah, I think anybody who has, um, who speaks boldly about anything, is going to get that because it's very triggering for a lot of people. And instead of yes. realizing that the trigger is actually something, something to notice that is going on with inside them, yeah. instead of po- focusing it and putting it out on the person who said the thing that made them feel triggered. Bingo, man. That's exactly right. Yeah, and it, it's that that. Uh, that emotion gets drawn out. So I don't, you know, I never take it personally when somebody comes back and it's just like, what? I don't take it personally at all. And, and if anything, I just feel empathetic. I'm like, man, I, I wish you could get up, you know, and I, I, there's a part of me too that wants to come back and go, oh, okay, cool. Well, I grew up in an abusive household. I was also homeless for a while. I was also right. Um, in order to build all these schools and to provide for the family and stuff, we actually uh, took a pay cut, went from six figures to 30 grand a year when we had our, you know, our first kid. Um, and I went a seven year stretch where I didn't take a single day off, but yeah, easy for me to say, you know, I, there's a part yeah. of me that still wants to come back with that I sometimes, know. but yeah. it does no good. Um, mm-hmm. It's understanding exactly what you just said, man. That doesn't have to be a personal thing. That is their own thing. And I, I genuinely want people to find like the people that come back and they're like, easy for you. I genuinely want that person to, to find success. Or I've had people come back later and go, hey, I got pissed at you a couple of years ago. But now this, but now this, but now this. Thanks for at least being honest, you know? Yeah. That's, oh, that's awesome. I've definitely gotten that too, some emails for before. Sure. And it's just, it's really heartwarming because you really just are trying to um, put out information that hopefully yes. can inspire and maybe make people think a little bit, a little bit about something that they never thought about before. And there's kind of two kinds of people that you often see, either someone that can take some information that they're not doing it, but they see that and you can be inspired by it, or you can see information and then just internalize it, start criticizing yourself and, and just going inward and feeling I could never be that. I could never do that. But then all that goes back to education and the way that we raise our kids, because we want to raise them to be inspired, to be go-getters, to not take things personally, to be critical thinkers, to be able to communicate well. All those things to me seem more important than, like you said, algebra. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Because then you can, you know, you learn that resilience. You learn, um, you know, what to love. So it's anti, you're anti-fragile, mm-hmm. right? At that point. Yeah. And you learn right. how to learn. You learn how yeah. to learn. Once you understand how to learn and you understand that you have the ability to learn anything you need to learn. And just as importantly, you understand that you're okay unlearning something that's no mm-hmm. longer relevant. You mm-hmm. learn to let those things go. When you have those two things, you have a superpower that's going to last you the rest of your life. That's wildly important. Right. And that's not to say, like you said, or like I said about algebra, it's not to say that algebra yeah. isn't important or we shouldn't learn sure. that or we shouldn't teach that to our kids. Sure. But what you're saying about the ability to learn, the ability yes. to be inspired and excited to learn, that is going to set them up for success long term to be able to learn whatever excites them. That's right. That's yeah. exactly it. And whatever is relevant to to them, you know, I tell people, you know, I have people uh, come back, well, I'm an engineer and I use calculus every day. Awesome. You need it then. Good for Mm -hmm. you. Like, that's great. Then go get it. I got an A in calculus. Um, Right now I couldn't pass anything past basic algebra. If you gave me a standardized test on anything, I could maybe pass an algebra test. Yeah. Uh, And that's about it. But I know I could go back and teach myself how to do all that stuff if I needed to for some reason. Right. It's just not germane to my specific goals and purposes. And that's, yeah. again, it's personal. And that's why with homeschooling, I think a beauty of it is that you get to tackle all those subjects to get them the wide range of things that they could figure out what they're most excited about as they get older and what they're good at. But then you yeah. also have more time to be able to, to do all these other things that you are mentioning before and what makes an excellent education. That's right. And you get to audit your own you get to audit your own kids too, because it's not, you know, I have three, I have three young heroes. All three of them have the same dad, but they also have a different dad, right? They have a different dad too, because all three of them need something different from me. 
they're all very different humans. So they need me to show up in different ways and support them in different ways because they're three different people. So, you know, we get to do that as a parent uh, and, and have that level of intentionality. And it's, it's pretty awesome, you know, and we've got, um, you know, I have a group of families from around the world that I lead through, through home education. And so, you know, I'll provide resources every month. Um, but more importantly than just the resources, we jump on, you know, we have a daily interaction through a platform. We jump on, uh, Q and a calls every single week so that we can just talk through how's everybody doing, you know, and what's going on. Uh, and this last week, you know, one of the, um, moms came on and, and she just, they just joined the, just joined this group. They've been, uh, in public schools for a number of years. She goes, just in these last two weeks, I realized I don't, I don't actually know my kids. I wow. knew the, you know, I got a couple hours a day and I knew the version of them that was post school. And I knew the version of them that showed up on the weekends, but they were on the weekends getting ready to go back to school. I didn't actually know them. And that was yeah. powerful. I want to yeah. know. I want to know. I know my kids inside and out. Mm-hmm. I know what they're thinking. I could look at them and I know what they're thinking. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm paying attention to them so hard. Yep. You know, and that's the level of intentionality that I personally want as a father. Okay, so two questions stemming from that. Going yes, back to that reel that I shared when I was having a chat with my sister and I shared a quote that you had said, triggered a lot of people. People were yes, really ma'am. upset by it. I know that you and I had talked a little bit about that. Um, for those listening that don't know what I'm talking about, I shared a quote that you said about how people feel like they don't, they're don't, they not qualified to educate their own children, so they send them back to that same system to educate their children. feeling on a- Left that, that feeling unqualified. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And you mentioned this earlier in the conversation. So yeah. what is your response to someone who would say, well, it's different because there's a difference between learning something and learning how to teach something. And so basically yeah. the criticism was teachers are different. But my, I mean, I, I want you to share your thoughts, but I also want to share one thing. To me, my yeah. initial thought is, well, if that was the the only prerequisite for being a good teacher, then that means anybody who went to school to become a teacher would be a good teacher. But that's not the truth because not everyone who becomes a teacher are good teachers. That doesn't mean none of them are, but not all of them. So it's more than that. But I'd love to hear what you would have to say. You're exactly right. I mean, I've had teachers, again, I've run schools, I've built schools. I've had teachers that worked for me that had PhDs in education and they couldn't teach their way out of a paper bag because they didn't actually care about young people. They didn't act, you know, that it was, uh, teaching is more of a DNA thing, educating, truly educating. It's more of a DNA thing than it is even a skill set. because you have to love the individual. You have to love people in general, and then you have to be showing and walking alongside somebody through a process, not barking in order at them. And that's a very different thing. And so, you know, and yeah, you're right. People got very upset and triggered by that. But a lot of the comments were, well, he's not a teacher. He doesn't, they didn't yeah. know. That they just didn't that, know. That's my whole career. So yeah, yeah I'm actually, you know, yeah. but I was a, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm a good uh, teacher, coach, mentor, but it's, it has nothing to do with a specific skill set. I'm willing to go, hey, Ellen, let's you and I walk along this journey together and figure that out, right? That's what good education actually looks like is that it's the willingness to go side by side with you and go explore together. Not for me to give all of my answers to you and bark a bunch of information. By the way, Google can do that. Yeah, we we have so much information at our fingertips now that we didn't have before. We have so many types of ways to uh, have curriculums if we want to have curriculums within our education to help. That's right teach us how to teach our children and all of it is together. But I also think when I look back at my own education growing up, it wasn't the teachers that necessarily knew how to quote unquote teach me something that made a good teacher. It was the passion. It was that the teacher was passionate and excited to to teach and grow with us. That 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 is what made a good teacher. That's what makes a good teacher. And if you, and again, all education comes back to self-education. So if you can, you can have the most excited, I can have the most excited person in the world um, who loves the cello more than anything and is so passionate and and is like, Matt, I am going to teach you 
how to play the cello. I'm so excited about this look and they're passionate and they're funny and they're engaging and they're awesome humans. I could have that person um, and I will appreciate their passion. I will love to watch them in their element. I am so like, there's no part of me that wants to learn to play an instrument. There's just is not. <laughs> I just, I've got zero desire. I will fight it tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. And their passion's not going to convince me to do it. So there's that other element too, mm -hmm. right? Of like all education is self-education. The receiver has to be excited as well. Mm -hmm. So with that being the case, then really it goes back to that DNA part. The good educator is the one who looks at who the individual is too and goes, okay, how can I stoke their curiosity how can i maintain that how can i audit them to the point where i know what they're thinking and i can ask them the question that's going to make them go oh my gosh and light up and get inspired yeah right so always and forever parents are the number one educator in their kids lives and there's not even close to a second place mm -hmm. if the parent's doing it right Cool. So I'd love for you to expand um, a little bit more for people who feel concerned or worried that they won't be able to be good educators and how they can help educate and walk alongside them, their children, if they choose to homeschool, like what specific ways. But before you answer that question, a little tangent, something you said about music, uh, it, it reminds me of growing up how I, my mom put me in piano class. I did it for a short while, but then I didn't feel like going. So my mom said, okay, she's not interested. You don't have to keep going. But as an adult, I kind of look back at that and almost wish that my mom nudged me to keep going in some things. Not like I had to do everything, but she was very, very much like that. Like, oh, if your child's not interested, like, okay, you don't need to do it. But looking back, I kind of wish that I learned some of those skills of certain things that would be harder or take longer to learn and, and as an adult that I wish I would have learned younger. So do you feel like there's a balance at all with like if your child expresses interest in a certain thing, like a, mu a certain uh, music aspect or sports or something else, what's your rule of thumb for that with kids? Like as they're getting older, they're like, oh, mom, I don't want to do this anymore. Dad, I don't want to do this. Are you like, all right, they're not interested or do you kind of nudge them to keep going? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that's a really nuanced um it's, it's got to be a nuanced answer, and I don't think there's a blanket statement here. So um, commitment matters. I, I still think that matters. And if somebody is truly inter interested and they're showing interest and, you know, if my son's like, hey, I want to go play t-ball and um, I want to go try. Okay, cool. You're going to play and you're going to finish the season. Like if you can't be partway through the season and say, well, I'm not interested anymore because sometimes what happens is they're not interested right that second and they, because they're just tired or they want to go play, they know you'll give them another option that sounds better at that point. And so they're pulling the trigger on you to allow you to go, oh, okay, well then go ahead and go do this, right? So a lot of times when our young people are saying they're not interested in something, it's because we have given them alternatives um, that sound better in the moment too, right? So are you aware of those kind of things? Because one of the things that I talk about for parents is, look, my young... I think young people need massive amounts of responsibility. So there's always chores to be done and things they can do and things they can tackle and take on. And I think they also need to be uh, really protected from distractions uh, that aren't wildly beneficial. So if you've got a young person that's got a lot of responsibility, does not have a lot of distractions, you're gonna see what almost seems like an inhuman level of commitment to some of these other bigger ideals where it's like, ooh, yeah, I want to tackle that. And you'll know if there's a genuine interest or it's a feigned interest um, and you'll you'll know if they've got other distractions that they're really trying to manipulate you to get back to. Again, you will know all of this if you pay attention to them. So what would so be I some think, examples of distractions besides like video games or TV? So video games are huge distractions. Uh, mm -hmm. TV is a huge distraction. Um the, if I'm honest, those are probably the two biggest distractions for, for most people, right? The, the tablets, the electronics, like currently, those are the biggest distractions for young people. Um, I also, you know, it's not necessarily falls under distractions, but when I talk about this with parents, I talk about medications and, and all that kind of being a distraction too, because it distracts them from who they really are too, and puts them in this weird state. So that's a whole nother conversation that parents get very upset at me about, but... Um, yeah. 
you know, it's another thing. But those electronics are, are some of the biggest, some of the biggest distractions uh, so, by far. So let's see. Before I have that other question, there's so many things I want to talk about. I'm I like, know. Okay, no, get back awesome. to that. I get it. Get back to that. But about totally. the um, the video games, that's a big one, especially for boys. Huge. Super big. So what are your thoughts on how you manage something like that? Do you have like a strict no video games in the house or do you have like a healthy amount aspect? What are, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah. I am not a huge fan of video games, period. And this is another mm-hmm. thing that gets people very, very upset about. Well, you can build a, you can, you can have a, a great life as a video game designer. You could, yes, you can. You bet. Yeah. You bet. <laughs> it's going to sure. be rare exception to the rule. It's going to be very rare. Yeah, for sure. But if, but you know what? If you want to give them something where they're jumping on game star mechanic or whatever it is, where they want to learn to build out a specific game yeah and you want to put a certain amount of time around that and just have a time frame cool man go get it go get yep. it like let's yep. see if that designer if that's really what they're after is the designer part of it and they want yeah. to create like great go yep. for it 99.9 percent of the time that's not the case right now video games are works of art mm-hmm. especially now they are phenomenally done they're, they're wonderfully done and they're meant to suck you in. What happens for our young men? And again, I'm not just the old guy with the white beard that's anti-video game. Like that's not yeah. it. <laughs> I work with young people and I've worked with thousands at this point. I can tell you, especially for young men, there is a DNA component for being a young man, and hey, by the way, I was a young man as well, right? So there's a DNA component where you want to go on an adventure. You want to go conquer something. You want to go save the princess. You want to go slay the dragon. You want, like, that's wired into us mm-hmm. that we want to express it. It's why like, we want to go play sports. We want to get outside. We want we want the adventure. Mm-hmm. What happens for too many young men is all of a sudden, the adventure is in this box and we're checking off all of that DNA component inside of us, but we're doing it in a virtual world that doesn't actually transfer to anything good. So then when we're outside in the real world, it's just the noise is turned down by comparison. Totally. We don't want to go get after our drive goes down because man, I can go get all my dopamine over here. I don't actually have to go even talk to the pretty girl anymore and and Mm -hmm. potentially get rejected. I can just, you know, I can just do this here, swipe this way or that way, whatever way you're supposed to swipe, right? Like I can do everything virtual. Everything gets churned into that. And so it really has been killing the drive for a lot of our young men. So I'm just not a huge fan in general, uh, personally. Can People will go, my son... That's where he learns, to, he socializes, he leads, he, great, man, go get it. I'm not telling you how to parent, that's fine. But there is a difference between socializing via headphones and actually having to look somebody in the eye and interact. Yeah. There is a difference between leading leading somebody on a mission in Call of Duty versus leading in a public setting at a, in a sports game where now I'm shooting free throws to win the game or lose the game and everybody else is around me, my failure is public or my success is public. There's a there's just a different level of stakes. It's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, so, you know, I, I, I worry about it a little bit because again, based on experience, I've had so many young men yes. who have told me this firsthand. Yeah. I 100% feel you, and I am actually having a conversation with Chris McKenna next week. I don't know if you know who he is, but he has um, Protect Young Eyes. I'm interviewing him next week for the podcast on um, kids and social media um, and all that, getting on screens too early. Totally 100% on board with you. I feel like a lot of people listening and watching right now might be in the same position as maybe I am, where you have the same thoughts about what you're saying, but they also are around other kids and friends who have video games and you also don't want to be like, no, you can't play video games ever. You don't ever get, you know, so you're like, what's the healthy balance? And the way that we have it in our family right now is, um, like working for like, it's like a, a short reward at the end of the day after you accomplish all your other things. 
Boom. That's right. Yeah. It is. It is the freedom gets handled or, or responsibility gets handled first, and mm -hmm. then you get freedom. It's always that order. Right. So that's, I, you know, I always try to express to young people that responsibility, again, responsibility and freedom are linked. The more freedom you want, well, if that moved up, responsibility has got to move up as well. Right. Because they are linked together. You've got to, the more freedom you want, the more responsibility you've got to take. And responsibility always comes first mm -hmm. and so it's such a good thing, thing to teach kids that it's so good to teach them like to you get bet. everything done check everything off your list that you know you need to get done for the day and then you yep. can relax and do you know the little thing that you want to do and then you can do the things you want to do yeah that's exactly <laughs> right that's exactly right and then yeah. if you find yourself whether you're a young person whether you're an older person you're a full-grown adult you're whatever you find yourself in a spot where you're complaining about something you wish you had or wish you could do or wish you well that is your your you know trigger to understand cool i'm gonna have to level up on the responsibility first and and maybe let the freedom you know the freedom piece slide for a little bit so that i can get to that next level of whatever that looks like i think that's a, a healthy way to go about it yeah and not um overexposing like picking very specific types of games that are you know Gentler totally. on the mind, you know, kinder yeah. games and also short periods of time rather than long yep. periods of time. Yeah, that's kind of our yeah. rule of thumb. But I, it's such a fascinating topic because it's one of those things where you don't want to be the one that your kid grows up and goes, my mom didn't ever let me ever do this, this or this in the name of quote unquote protecting me. But you also want to find healthy balances. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's I, I agree 100 percent. And it's that it comes down to the intentionality, you know, and I I don't worry about my young my young heroes really being like, oh, dad never let me, whatever, because they're so busy kicking ass that yeah. it's not, you know what I mean? Like it's not even yeah. necessarily, it's not even necessarily a draw because they're so busy doing something that they're not looking backwards at what yeah. else is over there. And you I'm know, guessing, like, does that have a lot to do with what you're providing them? And this goes back to education for parents. They're like, okay, well, how do I do this? I don't feel confident. I was raised in the regular system. Like, what would you suggest for them to set your, their kids up for that, to where they feel totally inspired and excited to go after and learn throughout yeah, the day all day? That's Yeah. So is the parent excited to go after and learn all day, every day? Yeah. Like, that's where it starts. I wake up every day. I am purpose-driven. I've got a mission. I am wildly curious. I know I'm going to learn some things. I know I'm going to talk to some amazing people. I know I'm going to have something that's kind of hard and I'm going to have to get through it. Like I know all of those things are there and I'm excited and I'm taking my kids along with me, right? So we are meeting as a unit. It's almost like this business sort of structure where it's like, cool, man, what do you have today? What do you have today? What do you have today? We all have our list, our purpose, like, all right, man, let's get after it and like, and let's check in and see how everybody's doing. I mean, we run it almost like a... Um, you know, it's really this tight military unit or business operation. I mean, we are all like, let's go. Um, and if there's any downtime too, I want them to come with me and take a look. Okay, here's what I'm doing right now. Here's what's going on. Here's what I'm looking at in terms of, um, you know, our uh, budgeting or, or this various company that we run over here. And, and here's kind of the cash flow. And I'm looking at the P&L. They don't have to understand all of that. People get mixed up and they go, well, your kids don't understand, you know, a full P and L right now at six. No, I yeah. didn't say they did, Yeah. but they're excited that I'm excited. And then I'm like, this is where money comes from. You know, like, yeah, 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 totally. like okay, cool. Right. Yeah. And so it's a concept that they're now being made aware of. What parents need to remember is we are establishing for our young heroes, what they consider to be normal. Mm -hmm. We're establishing that. So if being excited and purpose driven and focusing on real world outcomes and intentional about our relationships and intentional about what we stay away from, but focus more on the feet, like if all those things are the normal, that becomes the mentality for them. That becomes their baseline. Right. And, and it, you can individualize at that point. Right. So I can't give a parent a blanket state. You know, when I work uh, with all these parents that I bring through a home education uh, situation, I send them a menu of projects and challenges for a month that have a given theme. 
And the whole thing is cool, man. If you guys want to test these out, do these together. Do these experiments, these projects, these things together. But take a look at the rest of your day. What else do you guys want to put in? So for our family, you know, we've got, I'm doing specific things in the morning. My heroes are all, there's specific chores out on the farm that they're taking care of. Then they come back and they've got individual academic goals that they're jumping into, individual books that they're excited about. In the afternoons, um, you know, we're taking a look at projects together, whether that's projects they're working on, projects I'm working on for work. Like we're collaborating around that just so we can see what each other is doing. And then they each have their individual, you know, one goes to work with horses and go ride horses. The other one goes to gymnastics. The other one goes to ninja warrior class. And we're all doing all of this together. We are living what we feel like is an adventure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's awesome. the baseline for normal. That's awesome. So that's if, all I'm encouraging people to do. Love that, and I I think it's helpful to bring to this conversation um, something that I've spoken to Shafali Saberi about. Do you know who she is? She's a parenting author. No, ma'am. Okay, well, she has this counter experience about the obsession that sometimes parents have with doing too much, like constantly Mm. getting your kids to go here and go there and go there all in the name of creating the perfect quote unquote kid. And Mm. so her message is very like, let your children be normal. Like let your children be average is the word average. She's Mm. like, there's Mm. nothing wrong with letting your children be average. And I find this beauty in what you're saying and what she's saying at the same time to be a good balance because someone who might be listening to what you're saying is like, great, great. But then also if, if there's also neglecting the other aspect of downtime, averageness, what are your thoughts on yep. that? Yeah. And, and, you know, I want that. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I want to be able to, um, to articulate too. There are times when they don't have something scheduled, especially in the afternoons because they've gotten all of the, the responsibilities have been done. Right. And then I might have a day where I'm doing, I'm a guest on four or five podcasts. Right. And mm-hmm. I got it today. I get to do a few podcasts today. I get to like, this is awesome. This is great. Amazing. And this is part of my mission. And this is all, well, that's not anything they're necessarily going to join me for. So that in the afternoon, they don't have anything to do. So the distractions are still not an option. Mm-hmm. This afternoon, it's not like, well, sit around, just watch TV the whole afternoon and play video games. Right. You got downtime. So you figure out who you are and what you want to do with that. Mm-hmm. They might just go they might just go outside and hang out and play. They might sit on the porch and read. They might decide to grab Legos. They de- yeah. Like they just they have that. to decide to be a kid and they guess what? It's okay for them to get bored cuz boredom fuels creativity, right? Yes. Like all of that is is fine as well. So what do you say to a kid who's like, "I'm so bored, dad. I don't have anything to do and I don't want to do any of it." What's your, what's your response to that? Well, they don't say that anymore because, <laughs> because the only, at the times that they've had, they, that they have said that to me, my response has always been, there's no such thing as being bored. There's only being boring. <laughs> I that's love that. That's always my response. And so now they won't even say it to me because they know that's the response. Yeah, I um, love so, that. So, so they good. know that we don't care if they're bored. It's okay if they're bored. Are there right. all the responsibilities taken care of? If their responsibilities are taken care of, then at that point, it is up to them to decide what they want to do. Love because it. Because guess what? That's how it works forever. Yep. If Ellen gets bored. Ellen's got to figure out what to do with herself. I can't if even Matt remember bored, the last time I've been bored. <laughs> Bingo. The last right? time that I've had nothing to do or nothing I wanted to do is very I, never. <laughs> that's a that's a great thing. And there's too many adults that will go, oh, I'm bored. So I guess I'm gonna binge watch eight hours of Netflix. And then they're also usually the ones that complain about how they wish they had or they wish they could or they wish they did. You know? So I want the, I want them to just grasp uh, that's again, that sovereignty early. Mm, love that. That's part so, of it. So do you have a list of resources for anyone who's new to homeschooling and wants to figure out how to navigate what you're saying to do and what they what resources they could provide their kids? Like what are your favorite homeschooling resources? Yeah, my my favorite resources because again, when you're talking about resources, it's like, okay, well, what should education be for? What do you want to do? So there's a you know ranch down the street. And that's a homeschooling resource. There's gymnastics center over here. That's a homeschooling re- because you're just living life and, and being educated in the process. You can go 
like everything is a resource. Everything is a resource. So my favorite when people ask that is it's anything that's going to get the parent out of the mindset of bringing school home, right? Because like, oh, I got to teach academia. Dude, my friend Sal Khan has something called Khan Academy that will literally teach you every single academic subject you could ever want for free. The resources are there. Right? Masterclass is there. Udemy is there. You can look up MOOCs, M-O-O-Cs. Most universities put a ton of, of their courses online for free. You can, Ooh, interesting. You're not going to get credit. Necessarily. Right. You're not going to get yeah. school credit, yeah. but you can take the course. Right, You can go take a lot of Harvard courses if you want. Like The resources are abundant. So when people say, what are your favorite resources for home education? The real resources are what What do you need to learn and unlearn? Do you need to unlearn the school mindset? Go read John Taylor Gatto. Do you need to get more towards a freedom mindset? Or you got kids that you want towards a freedom mindset? Go read Tuttle Twins. Tuttle Twins are great. You know, yeah, I love, the, kid love Tuttle Twins. Yeah. Oh, Connor's a dear friend of mine, man. He's oh, great. no way. Just, That's awesome. Oh, he's a great guy. And he just sent my kids a freaking rad video the other night. Um, they loved it, man. He's such a, whoop. Um, such a good, such a good dude. Um that's awesome. So, you know, I, I don't have any specific like resources that I love because to me that's like a, well, if people are starting to eat, what food should they eat? Well, yeah. Man, that's a wildly, <laughs> wildly individual conversation. Totally. There's, there's a lot of different things to choose from and it depends on what your child is most inspired by. Yes, ma'am. That's exactly it. And what's going to inspire you as the parent? So what is your advice for those who would like to home educate? I like how you say home education. I'm so used to saying homeschooling or unschooling. Of course. But I like education that you've been using. That home education, it sounds more accurate to me because homeschooling mm. isn't school. You're not trying to replicate or copy what school is. You're creating Bingo. your own education. Yeah, so that's Bingo. that's a much better term. But what's your advice for those who would like to home educate but feel they can't because of their life situation? Maybe they're a single parent or both parents are at work or – um they, like you said, uh, they aren't feeling educated enough to homeschool, but we covered that yeah. one. Or thoughts on those who live in a country where it's illegal to homeschool? Because I actually have a lot of people. I get messages from that from people Me a too. lot about that. Me too. So that in of itself is a, is a much harder nut to crack because I get those as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a running conversation with quite a few families, some who are quite literally fleeing the country they are in so that they can do this. And is it different in certain – are there other some countries that have better education systems than but America? There are, there are some countries that actually educate more versus school. Right. right. So Finland is one that comes top of mind. Finland's government schools are much more like the schools that we have built out here. Not we as in the government, as in myself and the entrepreneurs that I've worked with. Right. There's, their schools look much more like that. And the students don't even start until they're seven. And at that point, it's not academic based. It's more character based. And then they're done by 16 and they have no homework and they have, you know, it's all of these things. They learn to uh, self-educate uh, and take on responsibility. So it's awesome. You know, so in that case, I think you're in a, you're in a great spot. The families that are, you know, in, in these countries where it is illegal, um, to me, it's very similar to... You know, maybe somebody who is out here who is a single mom and really doesn't have anybody else around like to uh, – because I know single moms that can make it work too because they get uh, somebody to watch the young heroes during the day and then they focus on all the educational opportunities when they are together, right? Like I know some moms that make that work. I also know that it's not fully possible for everybody in that situation and I don't blame them for that. So to me – it's the same thing as the person who they're in a uh, system that doesn't allow or a, a country that doesn't allow them to home educate. You're still home educating. When you're together with them, you still are home educating. You just have to be intentional about talking to them about what they're going to do during the game of school. Right. So one of my mentors, a gentleman named Seth Godin, do you know who Seth is? By any chance? Okay, so Seth is a, a phenomenal uh, speaker, author, uh, marketing genius. Uh, has written like 20 some odd bestsellers. He's a phenomenal guy. Um, 
Seth said, you know, my daughters went to school. They went to conventional school. I just made sure they knew the game they were playing while they were there. We were very intentional about what that game was going to look like for them so that they understood what they were playing, why they were playing it. They didn't take certain things too seriously. They were very intentional about relationships, about leading, um, about looking for certain patterns. And then we worked on their education when they got home. Mm, love that. Right? And yep. so for parents, I mean, I, I think it's that. You know, it's going, okay, look, we've got a little bit of the deck stacked against us. Let's be intentional so they know what they're going into so that they're avoiding some of the bad habits, the mental habits that we were talking about earlier. And then they're really going after who they are and what they want to do, you know, when, when they get home. Um, so if you've got to do that, find your balance, you know, in, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that's about the best bet for so many parents though. I think really what it is, is they feel like there's a fear of, Doing. They could, they could make it work. We could do it. We could figure it out. But there's all those fears of, oh, we're going to mess up our kid. Yep. You know, or there's also the, cool? or sometimes they just don't have a desire. Like, no, nah, I have no desire to educate my kids. And to me, that, that makes me beg other questions. That makes, that makes me sad. Yeah. I don't, I want to be around my kids all the time. <laughs> yeah. I want to be around them all the time. I mean, I enjoy the heck out of them, man. They're, they're great human beings to be yeah. around. Like, so what's going on there, you know? And for someone who is like both parents work, but they would like to homeschool, a lot of times there's ways around that. If you can yeah. reassess your life situation, feel like, yep. is there a way to downgrade so we don't have to yep. earn as much money and we can have one parent going to home or going to school, the other parent could be at home or could we do part-time somewhere so that we could switch off with other families maybe? There's a yes. lot of different ways to get creative yes. that a lot of people just don't totally. consider do a homeschool co-op kind of deal where it's like, oh, okay, well, our off days are, you know, we're off Saturday and Sunday, but they're off, you know, Wednesday and Thursday, and these guys are off Monday and Tuesday, and they, and yeah, and you can make those kind of things work, you're right, but it's that kind of thing, too, where you're having to prioritize and downsize and shift, that's where it irks me when people go, oh, easy for you to say, no, I left a six-figure position and went to $30,000 a year with my wife no longer working uh -huh. <laughs> and we still made it work so yeah. that she could be home with our oldest yeah so that we and there was a big sacrifice and it was really really hard and i would go back and do it again 10 times out of nine yeah <laughs> 10 times out of nine i love that have you and you know? honestly all of this ties into everything together, like your parenting, your educating, yes, how, like the example you're raising with your kids and even finances, right? So yes, if you're inspired by this, you're like, oh, we're just stuck. So much, so much of what is status quo is just being stuck in this conveyor belt right. life. Yeah. It's not even just conveyor belt school, but conveyor belt life of like, That's right. you got to earn this amount by the super nice car and you have to keep up with the Joneses and that we don't have time to be with our kids as much. Send them off here. Got to go to work, drive in the car to get home to, the, to pay for the house that, you know, all that stuff together. That's that's right. That if you reprioritize your life, there's this great documentary called Playing with Fire. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's no, a finan financial independence, retire early. And so it's no. all about how to be able to um, spend less, save more to retire yeah. early. Like there's this obsession or not obsession, but there's just mindset that we all have to retire at 65. But where does that even come from? We have to work all day, every day until we're 65. Like that's nuts to me. So <laughs> yeah. That's crazy to me on a number of accounts because yeah. so number number one to think that I have to work a job I don't like for that long yeah to to pay for everything is crazy and number two the concept of doing a bunch of things you hate for forty years to then oh. theoretically enjoy your life but to sit and do nothing at sixty five too because you don't know who you are or what like that also sucks I will be working until the day I die because I enjoy what I do in my mission. But I don't want to have to for any kind of financial reasons at all. Yeah. I just want to be living my life the way I want to live my life. Exactly. You and want oh, the, the freedom. Way, yes. That's the freedom. The that's freedom. The sovereignty. Yeah. Like, that's what we're talking about. I do what I want to do with who I want to do it. And all the other needs are taken care of. Like yep. that's what we should be going after. And that's not in a braggadocious way. That's just mm -hmm. what freedom means. Yes. Love that. And that, do you, I'm sure you know who Dave Ramsey is, right? 
I know Dave. Yeah. yeah. I know I'm going out to Ramsey's. I'm going out to their studio relatively soon. Right. That's awesome. I interviewed uh, his daughter, Rachel, for the podcast earlier. I would love to get him on the podcast, too. I just love the topic of finances. And that's actually one of the reasons why I started this podcast, because I want to talk about all the things that I feel has like made our life excellent, you know, and what what can help other people make their life just so excited about everything that they do. Um, But I I brought up Dave Ramsey because it's like something he says is like live like no one else so that later you can live and give like no one else. And so it's it's the long term thinking. Yeah, it's huge. And again, it's a different game. It's a game you don't learn how to play. You don't learn how to play the finance game. You don't learn how to play you know, you're taught, okay, well, you got to go to work. You got to pay your tax. What if I told you, you don't have to actually even pay taxes. <laughs> you just have to know how that game works. Yeah. And then you choose to play that. Interesting. Most people don't want to know that there's other games outside the conveyor belt thing. They've been told that their parents also did that everybody in their neighborhood, they don't stop to take a look and go, is there another game to play here? That's interesting. I don't. I don't know much about this tax thing you're talking about. I have to do a whole other episode on that. <laughs> I'm telling. There's a million different games to play. You know, and so it's ch- choose the games you want to play, man. Because there's a lot. So what about let's let's switch gears a little bit on something. Um, many people have uh, concerns about home education because of socialization. Is compulsory oh, school quality social socialization or yeah. not? What are your thoughts on that? That's such a great, yeah, I love that question. And when people ask me that, I always go, yeah, man, you are right. Socialization is a big deal. I would be really worried about the socialization somebody is getting in public school. I would be really worried about that. <laughs> totally. Uh, very much so. Because yeah. what does socialization mean? And who who is, so, you're always being socialized. Your young mm-hmm. kids are always being socialized. The question is, who's doing the socializing? Mm-hmm. And what are they being socialized for? Right. So again, going back to those mental habits. So you're telling me that you would rather have them have all the adult uh, figures in their life teach them that you know anybody that claims authority gets it. You would rather have that be a social component. You would rather have the majority of the people speaking into their life. If your child's six, the majority of the voices all day long are other six-year-olds. You don't know who that six-year-old is and what kind of life that person has and what kind of things that person is seeing at home. You want them being some of the main voices for your sake. Not you. Not you. you want your other six-year-old strangers to, to be the main voices um, that are there. You've got all of these, never mind the bullying things, even in some of your quote-unquote good schools, you've got kids that are you know, uh, twerking in the freaking quad at lunch. You got kids having sex and vaping in the bathrooms. You got kids. This is the socialization <laughs> that you want. Yep. Like as an adult and parents go, well, yeah, you got to learn that, you know, there's some things that aren't so cool sometimes you got. So, okay, cool. So then as an adult, if you want to level up and get better, do you go, well, I better put myself in prison for a few months to learn that there's shitty people out there. Like, what? <laughs> no. You expose them to greatness. You expose them to your ideas, your morals, your ethics, and then you're intentional about other social situations. And that's the, so again, what you make normal becomes their normal. Mm-hmm. So yeah, do we home educate? We do. And guess what? We sold some uh, goats not too long ago. There was a guy that was coming to buy them for land management over there. We had a bunch of babies, and so we had a whole bunch of goats. So this guy comes to buy the goats, and so I know he's on the way, so I'm going down the hill to go bring these goats up to him. And when he gets here, my nine-year-old greets him, says, Hi, my name is Brielle. You know, she shakes his hand. My name's Brielle. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming. You must be... You know, you must be Jed. And he's like, yep. Uh, And she's like, okay, so I've got the invoice for you right here. So here's what I'm going to need you to do. I'm going to need you to sign this. uh, And then I'll take a picture of it. That'll be our copy. I'll give this to you so you can keep this. And then it's going to be, you know, we can only do cash. It's going to be X amount of cash. You can give me the cash. Dad's down there. He's getting the goats, right? And so I brought the goats up and he goes, where did she learn? Like, what? (laughs) She's so wildly confident. I'm like, yeah. She's yeah. con- this is normal yeah. for her. Talking mm-hmm. to adults, dealing with the go- adults, they call the restaurants that we work with um, to see if they need new orders. Like they'll go do the deliveries. They're ta- that's socialization. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. That's Being so able to interact easy. with different age. I think that's one of the biggest, the yes, one of the biggest factors of social, like healthy socialization in kids is when they can get in a group with different age people, wide range of different age from children yeah. and babies to yeah. older, cool kids or just older kids in general and to adults, like being able to interact with everybody in confidence um, and help like help out with babies and all that. That is like amazing socialization. I think a that's, lot of people, a lot yeah. of people think that homeschooled homeschooling they, they imagine like living off grid in this little cabin where you don't see anybody else for months at a time and they say where's your socialization but that's really like not the 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 rule that's generally not that's, what's happening <laughs> that's generally not what's happening no, no we're going out to the store they're going out to restaurants they're going to activities they're going to they're talking to other humans all the time but they're doing it in a real world environment. They're doing it in a real aspect. They're very comfortable talking to older, talking to younger. Like there's nothing weird. And people go, oh, I knew a homeschool kid once, you know, when I was, when I was younger and, and they were very, very weird. Cool. <laughs> did you know any weird kids at your public school too? Yeah. Because you did. Right? <laughs> totally. So if, if school was the answer to weirdness, we wouldn't have had any weird kids. And, you know, it's, it's silly. Yeah, I think because uh, my mom had this fact, this idea of why it is that there's a stigma that homeschooled kids are weird. And I, I think that that stigma is pretty much dispensed at this point because homeschooling has exploded so much. But back when mm -hmm. I was growing up, very few people chose to homeschool. And my mom said, I don't think it's the homeschool kids that weird. I think it's just that the people who chose to homeschool were weird. It was like the weird families at the time chose to homeschool. Bingo. And so they were just different. But it's just That's not like it. that anymore. <laughs> it's it. I always, I always have parents that are, you know, oh, gosh, if I homeschool my kid, aren't they going to be weird? And I go, if you're weird. Yeah, if you're weird. Totally. Totally. Because I, I think yes. about when my son Elvis, he's my oldest, he's 11 now. But when he was like two years old, we would go into the grocery store and all of the employees knew his name. Everyone knew yep. his name and he knew all of their names. And they would yep. all talk to him, say hi to him, say goodbye to him, come give him hugs. Like he just knew everybody at such a young age. And if your kid is at school, obviously two is younger than in America where people are generally sending their kids to school, but there is daycare and everything mm -hmm. where they're only around one age. A lot of times mm -hmm. they can get into the real world and they don't know how to talk to anybody that isn't their mom or dad or a two-year-old or whoever, yeah. whatever age that they're in. Bingo. I know a lot of, you know, young people that are wildly well-schooled, but again, that's part of why I'm getting brought into these organizations. These kids are very well-schooled, but they're not very socialized. Mm -hmm. They don't understand how to talk to customers. They don't understand how to work with clients. Mm -hmm. You know, none of that is, is necessarily prevalent for them. Yeah. So, Cause yeah, yeah, it's one of the biggest myths. And it's one of those things where we just kind of repeat it because it's been a cult. Again, it's the cult mentality. You just repeat it. You just mm -hmm. say it. What about socialization? You just say it because you're taught mm -hmm. to be afraid yeah. that that's like a thing without actually giving it some thought. What does socialization mean? It mm -hmm. means you understand how to interact with the world around you and that normally you are willing to conform to the environment. Well, if that's part of the definition and I'm looking at the way the majority of the world operates, I don't necessarily want to conform yeah. to the rest of the world that doesn't know who they are and they're kind of sad and they mm -hmm. don't necessarily... I don't want to conform to that. I sure as hell don't want my kids to conform to that. Right. You so know, true. It's crazy too. Yes. I love that. Um, so how difficult is it to educate children of different ages together? If you're trying to, I know that the, like your examples of just like doing life together and how empowering that is because so much of what we talk about the modern system is very disempowering for kids. Like you said, you sit, you listen to the teacher, you can only go to the bathroom if they let you go to the bathroom. And there's only the specific thing you're going to learn, not this other thing you're interested in. That's not part of the thing. Like all that stuff is disempowering for kids. And I totally felt that growing up. Um, but when it comes to home education and educating children of different ages, does it make sense sometimes why, like how the modern system became the way it is? Because do you find it difficult at all to do curriculum style things with different ages at the same time? That's my no, question. It's just, you're just living life with people of different ages. How old, mm -hmm. may I ask how old you are? I am 35. Dude, I'm so much, I'm 43. Oh. <laughs> why are we talking to each other? Why are I know. We, oh, shouldn't we not, right? Why are we Ridiculous. I know. <laughs> That's right. And, and gosh, shouldn't I find out if at 35, you're making the same amount of money as I did at 35 so we could know right. who was ahead and who right. was behind. And totally. Who, it's silly. Like that, none of that plays out in real life. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually ends up being wildly beneficial because 
you know, my young heroes are very self-directed. They're all going after their individual things, but they can all help each other as well. So when my six-year-old is like, I don't understand this. Well, awesome. His nine-year-old sister or his 11-year-old sister come over and go, oh, here it is. Totally. You know, here's how to help you. And they come in and they actually help to teach him or to help walk him through yes. something that he doesn't understand. So I love it's that. wildly beneficial. And we, and part of that, you know, the fear around that concept comes from this school uh, mentality that there are certain things or certain boxes that need to be checked at a certain time of life and, and you know, a certain developmental stage. And that's just not correct. Um, you know, I think I even a lot of homeschoolers have that, like they might be really confident in homeschooling, but there's still this yeah. like, oh, but I got to do this specific thing or else this. they're at not going to, yeah, or else they're not going to yeah. be at the same level as their peers or whatever. Right. Which is, again, just a silly thing, right? Otherwise, it, it does that map out in the real world? Does that map out for adults? If another 43-year-old is listening to this and he or she does not make as much money as I do, are they behind or, or am I ahead? How do we measure who's happier? How do we measure our, like, it's just, it's a silly thing that doesn't exist in the real world, but we put this weird um, box around it in school, you know, and I, I use the example a lot of times when I speak uh, on education in public, I'll, I'll walk out and, and um, you know, start having conversations and I'll ask the audience, did anybody look at me when I walked out on the stage and think, ooh, Okay, that guy was a late walker. <laughs> no, no. I didn't learn to walk until I was 18 months old. Mm -hmm. So develop, was I behind and did that hinder me long term? Well, I ended up being a really good athlete. I ended up being a, a good martial artist. I ended up being a 5'9 white guy that could dunk a basketball. Like I was a pretty good athlete, but I didn't start walking until I was 18 months old. Well, I know a lot of very successful people. I know somebody who won a... a, a very prominent award for writing a phenomenal script that got turned into a movie and was made. Well, she didn't learn to read until she was 14. Wow. Yeah, totally. I think it's kind of earth shattering how much of that we're told it has to be this way really doesn't have to be because that's not how Correct. real life works in any, any capacity at all. Correct. So it's really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It very much is. We just, again, we got to start really trying to think through what we think we know and being okay questioning all of the things we think we know again getting back to where we're curious right like that's we, we need to we need to make that the standard yeah because the standard that we have now of like did you get a's on these five subjects like that doesn't play out in the real world at all what really does something my sister and i were contemplating with my husband we're like what is it that makes an intelligent person is it mm. someone who knows really like everything about a specific subject or mm. is it someone who is logical and is able to hear different opinions about something and change their mind and able to decipher I don't know it, it's it's such yeah. an interesting question like what it, same question as what makes a successful person is it yeah. somebody it's not really somebody who just has a good job because there's so many people who grew up in the modern system right got went to college even went to somewhere like Stanford has this incredible job, makes a ton of money, but are they happy? There can be somebody oh, who I makes, see. yeah, there can be somebody who makes $50,000 a year and they're way more happy than someone who 100%. has this incredible I've on, job. I've been on, I tell the story all the time. I was on a private, you know, the first time I was flown on a private jet, I was with the guy who owned the jet. You know, the guy's worth millions upon millions of dollars and he's crying on the jet because he hates his life. He hated it. And then we landed in this airfield and I talked to another guy as the, the, the executive went to go, clean himself up in the bathroom because he'd been crying because he's absolutely miserable and hates his life. I spoke to the airplane mechanic who was 40 years old and he was retiring at that point because he had lived below his means. He'd saved all his money. He'd only ever been an airplane mechanic since he was 18. He loved every single minute of it and was he was the happiest dude on the planet. You know, is this like the the paradox was just so it was so in your face and you know to, uh, I think it's Tony was it Tony Wagner? Might have been Tony Wagner who's at, but there's, you know, people who have done work on on the various types of intelligences too, right? And so that's that's a thing as well. And that's part goes back to that unique kind of DNA aspect. Um, you know, one of the most one of the greatest compliments I think I ever received was actually a principal that I interviewed 
uh, I, I was interviewing for a teaching position that I ended up getting. And, and the principal that I interviewed with, she said, you know, when I walked out of that interview, I felt like you could, uh, you're the type of person that could get along with uh, in-laws inmates and infants <laughs> love it and that's, like, that's that is an amazing compliment yes <laughs> it was and i thought that was the coolest thing and i look back on my life and i go man i do i do have an ability to get along with pretty much everybody under the sun i can find something to relate to them i genuinely yeah. enjoy people i mm -hmm. genuinely do love and appreciate them and so uh it's a very and so is that a specific intelligence right mm -hmm. and so Cause I'm, I'm, and there's a lot of other ways that I'm wildly, you know, incapable. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. the various types of intelligence, that's always interesting too. But, but that's a, also a type of skill on some level, would you say too? Sure. Like, sure. yeah, so it's a skill and the example sure. that you can pass on to your kids. And sure. so w by being the example of how you interact with people in the world yep. and like, that would be, I think the number one thing that parents can take away from this home education thing is like, how are you living your life? Which is what I love about everything that you're sharing. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's the most important part. Okay, so I just have a couple more questions. Um, can you sure. address concerns people ha might have with homeschoolers not being able to go to college or get a degree, which obviously is not true, but can you just like right. explain that to people? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I appreciate that you asked that because that's definitely one of the things that people have that's a, that it's a fear. Um, so I always start these conversations, again, in a number of ways. Um, one is college is college worth it right now anyways? You know, and I want parents to question that because again, the, the narrative has just been, well, yeah, you get done with school, you go to college and then college is what I would say as somebody who was at a university and who, somebody who has multiple graduate degrees, I would say college is actually a net negative for more people now than it is a positive. Mm -hmm. I, I actually very much believe that. Um, so, that aside, that's a whole nother conversation. Is college yeah. even worth it? Is it even a good idea? That aside, college uh, admissions process is also a game, right? I'm, I use that phrase a lot. There's the game of school. There's the game of, there's the game of taxes. There's the game of re relationships. There's the game. What game do you want to play? The game that everybody plays isn't always necessarily the game you want to play. So college admissions is also a game. Each college plays the game a little differently and year to year it can shift a little bit too. One of the things that I like to do to shake parents up is go, well, one of the ways to play the game very easily and to get into a lot of colleges is actually to not even have a high school diploma. And they go, what? And they go, yeah, drop out of school, drop out. If your kid drops out at 16 and then go uh, to a junior college, because most junior colleges, you don't even need a high school diploma, go to a junior college at 16 as an adult and play the junior college game for two years, and then at 18, you've got an associate's degree, you actually go in and apply as a, an adult transfer student, you're gonna most likely be weighted more heavily than if you were an 18 year old that just came out of high school with a 4.3 GPA. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of ways to play the game. Mm -hmm. Some universities actually prefer home educated students. Mm -hmm. Lots of universities actually have a separate application process. At Stanford, we had a separate application process for the homeschool students. Oh, interesting. You had your, uh-huh. So uh -huh. you had all of your 40,000 students that were applying the standard way, and we'd play the game with that, meaning, well, we're Stanford, so we can't go above 5% acceptance rate of these students, otherwise your rankings in the US News and World Report goes down. So it doesn't matter if 15% of them deserve to be there by the, you know, the metrics that are supposedly what allows you to get into school, 5%, boom, done. But first and foremost, we're looking for who are the rich people? Your future donors to Stanford. You can have a 2.3 GPA and be on probation, but if mom and dad are famous and are going to put a lot of money in, welcome to Stanford University, right? So, and then do you fill a need? We need a point guard. We need a, you know, somebody that swims the 200 IM, whatever. Like if you fill a need, welcome to Stanford. And then we have to take a look at, okay, well, this year we need uh, less Chinese men and we need more black girls. So that weighs you more heavily. Welcome to Stanford. 
right? So you're playing all of these levels before you ever get to the meritocracy that we're all taught that it is. Every university has a different level of game that is going on there. But at Stanford, oh yeah, at the 40,000 over here, oh, but we might get 5,000 homeschool students and we're gonna take 25% of them and the application process looks different. We wanna see a digital portfolio versus a traditional transcript, right? So home educated kids have been going to college forever and in this day and age, it's actually easier for them to get into a school than it is if you come from a traditional environment. It's actually easier. Okay, that's helpful to share. And then can you go into why you think college might not be the best option for everybody or even the majority of people? Yeah, there's a there are a lot of reasons. One, um, academia as a whole for a lot of universities has been taken over by um, a, a political idea. So when I say leftist, people get upset and they're like, oh, okay, well, this is just this Republican. No, I'm, I'm apolitical. I'm not even talking about politics. What I'm talking about is if academia is supposed to be something that allows you to learn how to think and to learn how to who you are, but you've got 95% of your college professors identifying as far left and they're coming in with a very specific agenda, you're not being educated, you're being indoctrinated. And I wouldn't care if that was far left, if that was far right, the point is it shouldn't be about any kind of ideology. It should be about how to educate the human being, right? But that's been subverted by a lot of our um, universities, unfortunately. There's also the fact that a lot of professors now get paid based on research versus teaching. They're paid to publish. They don't necessarily care about the educational aspect of it. You, prices are now through the roof. You have so many people that are going to massive amounts of debt to come out with a degree that everybody else has. Yeah, it's everybody not the same as it was when our parents It's not the same as it was. College. Everybody's yeah. got a college degree, but now you have $100,000 in debt to do what really amounts to the academic work of what you did in high school. It's really not all that much different. It's just longer. Yeah. And, and it doesn't guarantee you any, any sort of job afterwards at, at all. There's a lot of other alternatives where you don't have the opportunity costs, where you lose four, five, six years of your life wasting a whole bunch of time. You can actually go into the workforce. You can go into an apprenticeship or an internship in corporate jobs um, and, and get ahead without that, that debt. There's so many other opportunities now that college ends up becoming a net negative for so many. So what about for those who want a very specific job, like to be a doctor or sure. a, even a, a teacher, right? If there's certain yeah. things that they have to check you their box. Have to play it, that you have to play the game, right? Yeah. And that the percentage of people who know that going in is ridiculously low. Hmm. It's yes, ridiculously so true. low. So true. Right? I mean, but, I went to college as I, I was like, what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'll get a business administration degree because I just didn't know yep. what I wanted to do. I thought, oh, I, be, I better know. I better go to college. <laughs> And that's the majority, right? And I did yeah. the same thing. I'm like, I guess everybody's going to college. I guess I will. And I got all my straight A's in college too. Okay. And then graduated from college and went, cool, still don't know who I am, what I'm right. good at, what, what. And I, I definitely was. don't feel like what I learned in college was something I needed to be able to do the job that I do today. Like I, like I literally, I didn't need any of that. And, don't even remember most of it. <laughs> and most people feel that way. Mm -hmm. The majority, yeah. right? But yeah, yeah. Are there, is there a small percentage they know they want to go to med school Yes. So or to be an engineer. Game. Yeah. They want to be a specific, jobs. even engineering. There are a lot of people that go into the engineering field without an engineering degree. And a lot of engineers will tell you, I have a good friend who is, when I say he's a good engineer, he built his company up to about a $500 million a year organization as an engineer. So, I mean, he's a top notch world-class engineer. Uh, and he will tell you none of the engineering courses that he actually took had anything to do with how he actually operated. It was just playing the game. It didn't transfer to what the skills wow. were he actually needed to use. Interesting. Right? So there's a difference there too. But um, if you are going to play that game, then go play it as efficiently as you can. Meaning don't take on a massive amount of debt if you don't have to. Go do the JC route for a couple years and save a bunch of money. 
right? Work uh, on ways to make it very, very economically feasible for mm -hmm. you so that you're not trapped in anything you don't have to be trapped in while you go pursue that thing that you need to play that game. Um, yeah. You know, and understand, again, understand the game that you're playing. Is you some of it, why. is some of it not playing a game though? Like if it's like, I really want to learn to be a very specific type of doctor, seems like those types of degrees are needed and you would learn so much from that, right? Do you feel that way or no? Uh, no. Um, so <laughs> so you know, what, what you would know, you say? What would you say is you, the alternative then? So do you know, well, there, for somebody, you know, that wants to go into a very specific field that requires that degree, there is a no one, there, there's not an alternative, unfortunately. Right, right. Alter what would be the best, like I'm saying, if you had that ability. You just have to understand that you're still going to have to self-educate. So let me give you an example. So right. do, you know do you know who Rob Wolf is? No, I feel like um, this whole conversation, we're like, do you know this person? And we don't I know, know who it is. I know, huh? Totally. <laughs> I love yeah. it. So, so Rob, super, uh, super smart guy, really uh wildly intelligent does a lot of uh, conversations around health and nutrition and um you know but it just he's a super good dude and he's not dogmatic when it comes to any of it he's just like look man tinker what works for you eat real stuff like yeah uh, super good guy but he uh has been around for a long time kind of in this industry and he's been on you know rogan's podcast a couple times written a bunch of books and really really good dude he was living in the same um, city that I was getting my bachelor's degree in. And so I first got turned on to him. I was a kinesiology major and that was just because I liked sports. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't have anything I ever wanted to do with that. So, um, it's kinesiology major. I had taken some nutrition classes, you know, for the kinesiology degree and I'm like, okay, this is pretty generic kind of stuff. I went to one of Rob's seminars where we really dove into human performance and the way nutrition plays in the body and all the different variables and all this, you know, bioavailability and all the, all these things that I had never heard of in my life taking nutrition courses. I was like, this is interesting. But what was most interesting to me was that we had a number of doctors who were there who were raising their hand and they're like, we don't know any of this. Wow. We know none of this. Like we're taught more bedside manner and pharmacology. Like what pills are we prescribing? Mm -hmm. We're not taught this. We take a 30, you know, uh, 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 a, uh, six month course, you know, in nutrition. They are taking the basic of the same stuff I was, but then they were going to be. So a lot of these, um, professions, you know, if you want to be a surgeon, yeah, then the actual surgeon, like there are some things you're going to take that are wildly valuable, but you're going to have so much fluff and garbage that has nothing to do with what you're actually doing that you're again you're you're stuck in a game so how do you play that as quickly and as efficiently as you can yep and self-educate is kind of like your core message self-educate yep love it find and out what you need to know and disregard the stuff that you might even be taught to question it right not saying dis but question it dive a little deeper take a be willing and brave enough to look at the alternative option and just consider it Yep. You don't have to change your mind. Just look at other evidence too. Totally. And it reminds me of uh, the TED Talk called Hack Schooling Makes Me Happy by Logan LaPlante. And mm. uh, have you heard of that one? Yeah. Okay. I that does sound, that one sounds familiar. Yeah. It's it's a young kid. So it's not like college age, what yeah. we were just talking yep. about. But um, basically it just talks about like how he does life schooling, edu life education, personal experience, going into whatever field he is excited about. He'll become an internship. Uh, he'll become an intern at an internship for um, whatever company he's most excited about. And if we can give our kids those resources, they're going to love learning and and learn so much better by doing it in the real world, which is just like the responsibility stuff you were talking about. Because we can talk to our kids about how to be how to be safe in the kitchen, right? But if we don't let them yeah. actually get in the kitchen, then they're not going to learn how to do it very well that's at right. a young age. Yeah, that's right. I love that example too. So that's with the homeschool uh, group that I have, the home education group that I have right now. That's what our focus is this month: is cooking and chemistry. So we've got, you know, it's just an emphasis this month on just like let let your heroes get in the kitchen and start cooking and learn the knife skills and learn how. You know, these different things were like, let's, let's do that. And that's why, you know, when, when you're asking about college, there's programs like Praxis. Have you ever heard of Praxis? P-R-A-X-I-S. Mm -mm. So if you, if anybody listening, you go to discoverpraxis.com. 
uh, and Praxis, what they do is it's a six month uh, kind of a boot camp of transferable skills. So it's a boot camp of self directed, you know, learning how to write ad copy, learning how to do blog posts, learning how to do some very basic coding, learning how to do very basic communication emails, you know, things that are transferable to a lot of different industries, right? You'll do that for six months, do some projects around that. And then you'll go six months, you'll interview and you'll go work full time six months at usually at a startup, but it's in an industry that you're kind of excited about and you kind of like. You go take on this role. It's a paid position and it's paid more than the cost of the program. So you come out with no debt. It's a one year program versus four or five years. And like 98% of them roll right into a full-time position with the average starting salary of 50 grand a year. Amazing. That's awesome. Why would you not like yeah. the opportunity cost? There's no debt. Yep. You, you roll like, why would you not? So there's so many alternatives like that now too. Yeah. That again, just make the traditional college route far more unattractive. And again, yep. if you want to go to college, man, go to college. But a lot of times it is an emotional thing. We actually had... um it just popped into my head, but we had a student who at one of my campuses graduated from high school and walked off that stage at 18 and was offered a position with a nationwide organization that had up until that point with about a thousand employees nationwide, up to that point, they had never hired anybody without a college degree. Wow. They changed the entire structure to hire this young man at 18. It's amazing. He went in at like a $70,000 a year position leading other people, career level job. And his mom said to me, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. But I still hope he goes to college. And I said, okay, great. How come? Well, so that he can have that degree to fall back on so he can get a good job. <laughs> He'll get, he has a good job. <laughs> what is that? Yes. What is this that he has? Right. It's again, the cult mentality, the conditioning yeah. runs so deep. Yeah. You really don't think you have any other option to like go, live life. This is what everyone's doing. So I got to do it this way. So what are right, these, right. what are these campuses you're talking about for anybody who doesn't know about you and what you have created? Uh, I, I got to partner with uh, what's called the Acton Academies, A-C-T-O-N. Um, and, you know, it was I was on a mission to start my own thing um, and was was building a community around uh, what I thought education should look like for a group of young people. Uh, and in doing so, I was talking to a group of professors. One of them said to me, you sound like you're building an Acton Academy. Is that what you're doing? I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so well, I think you have to look it up because it sounds very similar to what you're doing. So I looked it up and realized there was a group of entrepreneurs. There was only a couple at the time who were working together, not in a franchise way, in a, well, I live in North Carolina. Ellen lives in Hawaii. We both feel the same thing about young people in education. We're both trying to build something and we're just going to bounce ideas and resources off each other kind of way. Uh, so I joined forces with them and, and um, you know, I launched multiple schools in California. I've now helped entrepreneurs launch these schools in um, multiple countries and, and states. And so there's a few hundred Acton Academies around the world. Amazing. And can point. they just go to actonacademy.com to look those up? They go to If they go to actonacademy.org, yeah, org. then okay. they can do it. Yep. Then they can do a search um, there and find it. But, you know, if people don't want to go to a full blown campus, you know, we've helped families open some of those small co-ops like, you uh -huh. know, you were talking about, um, or we help families home educate. The whole point of it is you have options. It's not just, oh, kids, you're five, got to go to school now for the next, you know, 13 years. Yeah. It, you have options and totally. they can all be really good <clears throat> options. So I want people to just know that so they can be intentional about making a choice. Love it. Okay, my last question for you. What is your core message you hope to reach parents with, whether they homeschool or send their kids to compulsory school or home educate or yep. send their kids to compulsory school? What would you like to leave them with at the end of this conversation? Stop being afraid. Mm, love that. Stop being afraid. Most humans operate out of fear in almost every arena. And it's because they're not willing to take action and take responsibility and they're not willing to question all of the different games they are playing, all of the different roles they are playing. They're not willing to question, is there something else I can do? 
And a lot of times there is, but it also means, again, stepping up in that responsibility, right? But they're afraid. Stop being afraid. Uh, it is, it is um, the biggest pandemic, epidemic, whatever you want to call it, that I, that I see in society. Love it. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. I could go on and on with you. I feel like it's such an, such an empowering, powerful, important conversation to have. And I appreciate everything you're sharing online. Everybody go follow his Instagram. I think it's just Matt Boudreau, right? Matt Boudreau. Yeah. Such an amazing, such amazing content you put out there. Daily inspiration to help you just take charge of life and be the best parent you can be for your kids. You're awesome. Thank you. No, honor is mine. I appreciate your message. I appreciate your voice. I appreciate everything you do too. So it was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, great. I think we're going to end it here. And thanks everyone for joining. Mm -hmm.